Uh, good evening, friends, and a very warm welcome to CSDS and to this evening's program. Uh, our distinguished speaker today is Professor Prasenjit Dwara, who's currently the Oscar Tang Family Distinguished Professor at the Department of History, Duke University. Uh, prior to this, Professor Dwara was the Professor and Chair of the Department of History and Chair of the Committee on Chinese Studies at the University of Chicago and subsequent to which he was a Raffles Professor of Humanities and Director Asia Research Institute at National University, Singapore. Uh, Professor Dwara uh, is the author of several books. I'm not going to list all of them. Uh, his first uh, book, uh, Culture, Power and the State, Rural Society in North China, won the John King Fairbank Book Prize and the American Historical Association of the American Historical Association and the Joseph Levinson Prize for the Association for Asian Studies. And after his early work on uh, rural China, Professor Dwara has written, gone on to write on nationalism, imperialism, and origins of modern historical consciousness, and more recently on cultural traditions and sustainability. His book, uh, The Crisis of Global Modernity, Asian Traditions and a Sustainable Future was published by the Cambridge University Press in 2015. Subsequent essays include Oceans, Gardens and Jungles, World Politics and the Planet, published as the Duke Global Working Paper Series 22, and Oceans as the Paradigms of History, Theory, Culture and Society, December 2021. And I, I'm informed that both of these are available as open access documents, or at least the latter one is. Okay. As an open access. Culture Theory and Society. Uh, this evening, Professor Dwara speaks to us on biocultural diversity and agency in the Anthropocene. A very warm welcome, Professor Dwara. Uh, if you can just give me a minute, I will put on also my version so I can see the notes. Uh, I uh, am very pleased to be back at CSDS, my old stomping grounds. It's been exactly four years. I see. I'm glad to see all old friends around me, just a few new faces. Happy to see that there are some new faces. <laughs> and um, I've been getting all your, uh, your uh, publicity of talks and so on. And the one thing I've noticed is that the Hindi program has really taken off, which is uh, all to the good. <laughs> And um, which is what I had also uh, yeah, hoped for. Now, I have to apologize a bit for this paper because many of the papers I gave earlier at CSDS were very polished, complete. I don't know if you were polished, but they were completed papers. And um, this one is one I'm beginning. So uh, rather than, you know, apologize anymore for it, I will welcome your comments to enhance it. And, um, and sort of get rid of the problematic uh, aspects. So uh, let's start the PowerPoint. So as you can see, it is called uh, Biocultural Diversity and Agency. Unfortunately, although the paper was supposed to be more about uh, agency, I got sort of uh, stuck in the biocultural diversity part and had a little bit about agency towards the end, because this is the part that uh, I, uh, uh, okay, now I'm fine. Okay, let's move to the next uh, part, the next uh, slide. Oh, now I don't have connection, that's okay, doesn't matter. Uh, so the goal of uh, the paper, the argument, the goal of it is to explore the impact of what I call the epistemic engine on the rainforest regions and rivers of monsoon Asia. Um, I don't have a map of monsoon Asia, but you, I think you, everybody here has a pretty good sense of where it begins and uh, how it goes on into Asia. So basically I'll be talking uh, about Southwest China, in particular, the province of Yunnan and Southeast Asia with which it is uh, geophysically, culturally related. Uh, now, 
in this first slide, I want to talk about what I call the epistemic engine. Now, this is a concept I developed for another paper uh, uh, that was invited by Peter Katzenstein, uh, a political scientist, on, uh, on a volume that he did on uncertainty. And uh, what I, so it's really sort of slightly imposed in this paper, but I think I do need it. It refers to the epistemic engine, refers to the dynamic circulatory force among global nation states that drives the accelerating time of uh, capitalist modernity. And it is this epistemic engine. So it's a concept and it's a sort of hard to sort of see the, uh, the instruments and the assemblage of this concept. But materially, I think we can think of the epistemic engine as an assemblage of, I, by the way, you don't really need to, I have a lot of pictures. You don't, you can just listen to me because these points are more for myself than for you. <laughs> So I'll be mostly talking from them. Of course, I'll tell you when the picture comes up. Uh, the epistemic engine is the assemblage of states and capitalist structures globally that unceasingly seek resources, markets, and profits globally, right? So, uh, and this is, of course, not a novel idea. This is uh, my, uh, my main inspiration is... Uh, the sociologist uh, Arighi, Giovanni Arighi. Uh, and uh, so that's the material dimension of it, right? Cosmologically, these, uh, these, these structures, these state capitalist structures or state and capitalist structures uh, are cosmologically based upon the idea of the enlightenment and the enlightenment dualism between subject versus object, subject being uh, initially God, but then human versus, or scientist versus object, which is nature. So the subject-object uh, differentiation and sanctions the mastery or conquest of nature in the name of progress. Now, so that's the cosmological sort of foundations of this. Uh, epistemically, why do I call it an epistemic engine? It has, uh, there is a notion of knowledge that is power knowledge, it's Foucauldian idea, the regime which separates not the true from the false, but, uh, but what may be acceptable knowledge or the possibilities of knowledge. Uh, and here very clearly we can see, we will see here that uh, for instance, where, whereas the enlightenment uh, 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 epistemo epistemology takes uh, the idea of the human as central, the humanist version, uh, we, when that is happening, we find that it's very hard to put nature at the center of this. Uh, so, so that's the sort of the conditions of possibility for nature until recently have not been possible in this, uh, in our whole epistemic system. So the vehicle of the um, epistemic engine is the nation form the territorial, the identitarian, the exclusive. And this is the form that has legitimated the world order since the 19th century by adaptive reproduction. It circulates uh, itself uh, and, you know, people, cop they uh, not only do they circulate all the forces in the world, but they themselves are circulatory. They themselves uh, 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 reproduce themselves, copying other nations and selecting elements, but creating the assemblage of the nation. The goal of progress is framed by the competition between nations over the control of global resources, which has historically been the, uh, the fuel for the engine, for the epistemic engine, and which has therefore lost, left its exhaust on the planet. And this, by that, I mean, not only fossil fuel exhaust, but the exhaustion of everything and resources in particular. Okay, next, please. Okay, so this is a diagram of the epistemic engine. A lot of it is something that uh, I, uh, uh, that is not, uh, uh, that is, there's too much detail as it were for uh, this uh, paper. I don't know why I keep losing this. But uh, the, the important thing for me is that we just focus on the left side. You see the uh, Enlightenment uh, 
uh, enlightenment, what does it say? Cosmology becomes, I can't read it, it's such a long distance. Uh, enlightenment cosmology is a, a foundational element. And below that on the left-hand side, you can also see the hyperhumanist, which is a strange word that Peter Katzenstein used, but more than human cosmology, right? Including humans uh, and others. And uh, on the top, and then you see the epistemic engine and the nation state system around it. And then which all influences the world order, which then influences the world politics. Now you have uh, on the top part, you have certain uh, movements that come out of the enlightenment uh, cosmology including uh, civil society movements that may or may not be mediated through the epistemic engine, right? So you, some of them go directly into world politics, but they often also go through. Those that are not, for instance, are religious movements which uh, do not necessarily regard the human-centric uh, version as at the core. They may more think of it uh, in terms of a transcendent being or something like that. and. Uh, so, you know, it is from their worldviews, which has a certain autonomy. Now, if you look at the bottom part, you see that the hyperhumanist uh, category cosmology produces what I would call, what I didn't have time to develop. I, in fact, I can't change this thing at all. I don't know how, but uh, I have to create a new uh, engine for this paper. Includes indigenous movements as well as local communities and marginalia and so on in the world that uh, influences uh, not so much through the epistemic engine, more or less directly to the world politics, but can also uh, uh, be mediated through the epistemic engine, often for uh, uh, practical reasons, but you know, practice can often be absorbed absorbed into an ideology or a cosmology, right? So there is that that question as well. Can we move to the next? Okay, uh, go on. Okay, so things that you already know very well, but just to locate it in terms of biodiversity and cultural diversity. So apart from industrial extraction, apart from pollution of air, soil, and water, resource extraction continues, especially in these resource frontiers of these, which are sort of the last sort of frontiers. Well, nothing is last in capitalism. It's now all of space, but at least on Earth, on Earth, and uh, there's also a lot of undersea, right? But uh, on, on the terrestrial sphere, you have, you continue to have mining, deforestation, and not least hydropower, right? Uh, and these are all prevalent and increasing intensely and rapidly in the monsoon rainforests of Asia, which were hard to penetrate before uh, modern, before contemporary technology. This has led to extinction, reduction, and displacement of local and or indigenous communities, and the loss of local knowledge to manage these natural resources sustainably for future generations. And let us note that the rainforests of Asia, monsoon Asia, that is uh, for those who came in late, I'm talking about Southwest China, Yunnan, and parts of uh, what we call, you know, uh, mainland uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so the uh, rainforests of monsoon Asia are together with the Amazon are among the largest carbon sinks in the world, right? So it's, uh, it's number two to the, but it can also be a tipping force, a tipping point in uh, uh, climate change. The forest role for water can be seen in three main aspects. Right? First is the hydrological cycle, where the forest itself is a sponge that captures a lot of the water and stores it so that you know the rivers don't overflow and don't erode their banks and all of those kinds of things. The second is water quality maintenance, which is that it's a filtration trap for all kinds of sediments and so on. And third is that it reduces water related hazards. For, so for instance, you know, the Yellow River in China, it, it, the reason it's yellow is because all this less soil, L-O-E-S-S, -S, less soil keeps uh, uh, falling into it and it keeps getting deposited. But that's because there has been so much uh, um, 
agriculture on this very unsuitable uh, plateau, the Lewis Plateau. And so as a result, you know, the Yellow, uh, Yellow River became this river of sorrow in China. And now they have started planting all kinds of uh, grasslands and trees and so on to stop this erosion. And deforestation. So forests and rivers are best thought to be protected and defended by local or indigenous communities of eco people, people immediately dependent on these uh, on these commons for their livelihood. And um, uh, Gadgil uh, writes uh, very uh, very passionately about this, and he has lived among them as well. And they are also called by Daniel uh, Conversi exemplary communities, right? So the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People, and who also happens to be a member of the steering committee of the Interfaith uh, Rainforest Initiative, which is also a UN initiative, reports that mapping these new kinds of geomapping and so on, satellite mapping, reveals that the most successful or best kept rainforests are in areas where the rights of Indigenous people are respected. This shows that they are the best stewards of uh, or and custodians of the rainforest. Can we move to the next? So here is a general picture of the area that I'm, not the area that I'm talking about. There's also much further south that I'm going to be looking at uh, in Vietnam and Cambodia. But uh, the uh, you can see that the Circumhilum Himalayan uh, 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 plateau, Tibetan plateau, is the source of rivers, which is the lively where 2 billion people rely on these rivers uh, that originate in the Tibetan plateau. Glacial melting, river diversions, and dam building are endangering the sources of livelihood of hundreds of millions. Intergovernmental cooperation is imperative to address these problems. And we'll see that a lot of the problems come from uh, boundary controls, um, and you know, it uh, generates uh, much. Uh, I also want to show you the right hand uh, map, which is a map of uh, Yunnan and parts of uh, Southeast Asia. You see two particular rivers, which I will talk about. Actually, I'm talking less about the Salween than I'm talking about the Mekong. But here you see certain uh, two important things. You don't see the many maps, uh, many dams on the Mekong, but you see several uh, dam proposals that were made in the early 2000s on the Salween River. And, uh, but the second thing I want you to note is that green shaded area. You know, the civil society in that period in China between 2000 and 2012, which was the period of the height of civil society activism, especially environmental civil society activism in Yunnan and, uh, and the rest of China, as well as in Southeast Asia came together and forced or almost or imposed on the UN UNESCO to declare these regions, the Eastern Himalayan protected regions, right? This happened, I think in 2003 or four. In fact, uh, Wang Jiabao, the Chinese prime minister, who's a geologist, said, OK, I'm giving up on dams here for the time being. And the moment he left office in 2012 or 2013, uh, Xi Jinping comes into power and, you know, they have been restarted. Not all 13 of them, but seven of them have been restarted. So we don't know what's going on. Next, please. We do know what's going on, but we don't know the details. So I just want to talk a little bit of the, the Chinese part of this. Uh, there is a long and ironic history of human environmental relationship in China. Mark Elvin, the famous Sinologist, uh, he has an essay entitled 3000 Years of Unsustainable Growth. Now, if you think of it, this is an ironic title, right? If it's unsustainable, then how is it growth for 3000 years? And uh, uh, people talk about, he himself doesn't explain, but people talk about it in different kinds of ways. And I think it's possible to, to see that despite China being a land of catastrophic famines, as is India, uh, the land had been sustained for 400 million people right up to the end of the 19th century, right? So uh, it, they were doing something right, even though large numbers of them were being killed before 
by were taken by famine and warfare and so on. But the 19th and 20th century history of China is one of environmental degradation. There's no question, you know, both because of population and because of new technologies. But there was, but I'm not interested in talking about that part of China. I'm interested in the many pockets of protected forests and waters that have even survived in China, such as China's sacred mountains. China has a whole set of sacred mountains, like Mount Tai or Mount Huangshan or something, or around Buddhist monasteries and Taoist temples and so on. You have uh, groves. Uh, and many villages across a wide belt in South China conserved what I call feng shui forests. Now, some of you may have heard what feng shui is, literally wind and water. It's considered a whole superstitious system of, uh, of geolocation in relation to spirit forces and qi. But uh, qi being, <laughs> you know, the, the uh, uh, ether that goes around uh, the world, uh, the universe. Uh, but... Uh, but these were the feng shui forests in these villages were a kind of sacred forests of old growth trees around the village, which are designed very interestingly to protect the hydrological and wind environment, right? So make sure that erosion doesn't take place, that the water is kept safe, you know, they're around bodies of water and so on. So it is critical to community survival and well being. Although may, they may not think of it that way, but that is historically how it has functioned. Chris Coggins, uh, uh, one of my research partners, and his collaborators have done the most work on, uh, on feng shui forests. And uh, they have recently, in a volume, extended their research to survival and the role of sacred forests across not only East Asia, the rest of East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. There are several papers on South Asia, including one by Mukul Sharma, who some of you may know, uh, of course, he's in <laughs> great debate there with another South Asianist who are working on Santhal, uh, the new Santhal religion. Does anyone know what it's called? Uh, uh, Sanya or something? Huh? huh? Sarna, Sarna, Sarna thing, the, the whole thing on Sarna. And uh, they explain. They explore, these researchers explore the frequently indigenous communities which continue to depend upon the disappearing forest resources and which they have traditionally protected by sanctifying them through cosmological systems and their deep knowledge of local ecology. So this is also very important. So I'll come to Yunnan now, which is the home to 24 ethnic minorities who live in forested hills and mountains. It is also the cradle of, universe, of environmental activism but also at the same time, uh, the object of ravaging deforestation and dam projects, right? So let's move on to the next. Uh, Yunnan forests and well. So the rapid economic, oh, so yeah, here's a picture of, of Yunnan first. Um, you can see uh, it is the, you know, just north of Myanmar, Burma, and uh, to the east of uh, Assam. And you can see it's look, and you can see precisely the the hills because it's really the eastern edge of the Himalayas, and then it's sort of it, the terrain is in many ways similar to that of Assam. Uh, and then you have uh, these uh, deep rivers that cut through. And I'm only going to look at the uh, the uh, Salween River, which in China is called the Nu River, and uh, the Mekong, which is the one further to the east which in China is called the Lansang River, right? And as you can see, there are lots of ethnic minorities. You know, I was looking for some picture that showed ethnic minorities in their work or marketplace activities. But all you can find, which is very much the Chinese typification of ethnic minorities in this region, are uh, dancing women in their costumes, right? I mean, that is how, and it's also feminization and so on. So here's at least something where I think it's a more natural, more uh, unstaged uh, sort of statement of their ac activities, market activities. Okay, let's move on to Yunnan. So I think I, did I, did I miss? I think I missed one. Can you go back before? Yeah, forests and biodiversity. So rapid economic growth of China led to massive environmental costs, particularly through industrialization and all of that. 
This is also true of India, as we know, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, all of these uh, states. Unsurprisingly, these states simultaneously create protected areas, even while facilitating massive extractive and hydropower projects. More recently, China has actually developed a newer strategy, which is to conserve its environment and outsource its uh, various uh, resource requirements, right? So you have this uh, uh, different ways of doing things. Uh, so con conservation practices can be helpful, but it often offers one size fits all, homogenized models, which often conflicts with uh, local knowledge and community interests. Now, studies of protected areas and conservation in China, in particular in Yunnan, have produced mixed results. The neoliberal approach to raise revenues through tourism, often at the expense of conservation and local community. Local communities apparently in Yunnan get only 3% of the total take uh, of these uh, enterprises. A few areas have more local with more local participation in decision-making, both ecologically and in terms of these new economic opportunities are more successful. Now, Yunnan is the most densely forested borderland province in the Southwest, right? It is a biodiversity hotspot globally. The Eastern Himalayan region, as you know, has UNESCO protected status, six major river basins, and the population is 48 million. And there are 24 ethnic groups. I think I mentioned that before. Now, deforestation in the region was rapid uh, until 1982. Then, uh, it continued to be really rapid until uh, it was just logging was just prohibited by the government in 1998. Forests were then after that, forest cover grew a lot in uh, Yunnan, but it was all rubber plantations. So it was monocropping. So tree cover is now maintained is the highest in China, but biodiversity is lost, right? So uh, yeah, and then next, so Yunnan rivers and dams. In 2022, there were six large hydropower stations on Ch China's upper Mekong, that is in the Mekong, Lansang part. A dozen more are planned, although 13 dams on the New River or the Salween were opposed and rescinded, as we said, seven dams have been planned on it. Even though four geologists have written that this is a very fragile geological zone. Meanwhile, Chinese hydropower companies and Southeast Asia state agencies have planned dozens of other habit, uh, dams downstream on both rivers. Electricity for urban consumers and industry is the main interest of these. Habitation degradation and biodiversity loss in both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems have occurred. Dam impoundment, reservoir creation has changed sediment regimes and chemical and biophysical qualities of water. Flooding large areas of land have affected forests, shrubs, the loss of migratory species, introduced invasive species. And most of these changes to natural systems are irreversible. I mean, you know, you, you, they're gone. You cannot, it's going to be very hard to reproduce them. The government reports that 10 million people were relocated because of dams, but alternative Chinese estimates suggest in, in Yunnan alone. Uh, but alternative Chinese estimates uh, suggest at least 22 million have been displaced. And compensation has been low and does not include, you know, there are so many life uh, uh, creating measures in your environment that you don't recognize until you lose it. For instance, your embodied, your embodied wealth, which is your natural skills in a certain ecology or your particular job skills in a certain ecology, or relational wealth, right? The whole community, you're sort of separated from that. So all of these things happen. And minorities often need to find new occupations that they lost uh, in grazing and forest lands and so on. Move on. Okay, here is a picture of the two rivers beginning in the Tibetan plateau, the Salween and the Mekong, coming down, and this is a very recent 2022 to the right, uh, 2022 um, picture. Uh, the left has both Salween and Mekong. The right has only Mekong. And these are different dams that have been proposed or are already constructed. 
a lot of the orange ones are already constructed red and orange. And uh, there are hundreds, more than a hundred at least, a lot of them on the tributaries of the Mekong all along here, right? Okay, let's uh, move on. Now I want to talk about, uh, can you also just show the next uh, slide and then come back? We'll come back, this is just to give you an idea. Uh, I want to talk about the Avatar, which is uh, uh, the movie Avatar. Uh, this about the key people in the Prelang forests of Cambodia. I visited them also once. Prelang in, uh, in Khmer refers to our forest is the largest lowland rainforest in mainland Southeast Asia. It is to the east of Phnom Penh. And it's vital to the, it has a wildlife reserve, uh, a new one, 2016, and is vital to the livelihood of the indigenous key people. There has been massive illegal logging of their forests from more than 20, 30 years, which led to regular protests by the key. They used to show up, uh, they, they were closely connected to the Buddhist monks. They would show up in the large military square of Phnom Penh and demonstrate there on men, most weekends. But uh, they didn't get much attention. They were there regularly, you know, like protesters. Then in 2011, they were seized by an idea to call themselves avatars, uh, taken from the movie, representing themselves as the Navi. You know, those of you who've seen the movie know that these are these uh, quasi humans or more than humans, perhaps, who occupy the forest with blue skin and things like that. and. Uh, once they did that and they combined it with their musical forms for petitioning and prayers and so on, they became hugely popular, not only among youth and the cities and the universities and so on, but across the nation, uh, civil society groups and globally. In fact, I read about it in 2011 in the Singapore Times and I followed the route from there, right? And, uh, and they got a lot of attention. And they created this uh, this uh, this um, uh, this network called the Prelang Community Network, and it was formed. The monks are very important in this because the monks engage in tree ordination. Right, once you ordinate a tree, it becomes sacred, and it's very difficult to then uh, uh, log it. But more than that they created the grassroots level community monitoring of forests. And for this, they got a lot of resources because of all this support, um, motorcycles, phone apps, and so on that could sort of special phone apps for, you know, who we see some loggers in this area and so on. And they were successful for many years. In 2017, I visited uh, Phnom Penh. I didn't visit Prelang. And we conducted a meeting with uh, not only the Prelong uh, uh, protesters themselves and the uh, PLCN group members, but also several others, not only from Cambodia, but from Laos and as well. In Cambodia, there's another very important group in the Cardamom Forest, further south of uh, Phnom Penh, uh, called the Arayang Group. And they have actually succeeded in preventing a Chinese hydropower company from coming in. Literally, their surveyors wanted to go in and they held them. I mean, you know, this is, this is but it's also a question of, you know, how they, um, how they scale up because there are global organizations also involved. And they too, I guess this is the kind of problem that Xi Jinping and Modi have with global uh, <laughs> organizations coming in to local civil society, right? But they, they had this, uh, this, this ability to scale up and prevented them at the local level, which is very interesting. But by 2014, uh, Hun Sen of Cambodia created a law for registered NGOs, which were very much like the Chinese gongos, which are government owned NGOs, uh, which uh, actually excluded the real grassroots PLCN. And in 2016, the government created the Wildlife Reserve Prelang uh, uh, a Sanctuary, which uh, interestingly prevented the key from entering the reserve area, which was a very important source of their livelihood, right? So in a way, the state moved in in these directions. 
and while they have been they can still they still guard their own protect and surveil their own forests but there has been rampant illegal commercial logging with local government collusion uh, since then 9000 hectares of forests were lost in 2000 uh, in 2020 and some 20% more trees were lost in 2020 than in 2019 of old growth trees these are right Okay, next, please. So here are some, no, you can show that again. Here are some, actually, that on the right, you see that picture was on the cover of my book. It was, but it was, I barely knew who they were. I further later on went and did the, the, uh, the, so Avatar is an ancient uh, Hindu Buddhist idea that has returned by way of Hollywood to them. By the way, there are avatars among, the avatar idea was picked up also by the Dongria cones here. They were picked up by Bolivians, uh, forest dwellers, and several others, and they've been quite successful. And the Dongra cones have, of course, been the most successful because, he, he, because they managed to get rid of, uh, what is it, Vedanta or something from that, from bauxite mining, right? Okay, next, please. So these are the two, when I went, by the way, that person in the green shirt and the balding man in the lower left-hand side is me, but, uh, but the real bald people are monks, as you can tell. Uh, the, the one on the right is a very uh, outgoing monk. He speaks good English. He, he learned his English in India, in Mumbai or Pune or something, and uh, where he was supposed to learn Sanskrit, but he learned his English as well. And he, he's a member of parliament and he says, oh, I see Hun Sen this, that, and the other. But the guy on the left is a very serious, he doesn't speak a word of English. He is the most important leader in this. This other guy is a public figure, right? And this was the ordination thing. And so, okay, next please. Now this is the other, the Cardamom Forest Areng community. And uh, the pictures are very small, but if you can see the one, they've really created a kind of boundary, right? No, no surveyor, no, um, you know, person who wants to measure these, these areas and so on can be allowed in here. And they created a whole barrier, which they are now celebrating on the top, uh, on the right hand side, the top one where they're all holding something together. And you can see there's also a Spanish gentleman with a beard uh, who's towers over the others. And, uh, but these, these three in front here are the first line of protection. Okay, let's move on. But that too is, you know, they were in the meeting, they were actually expressing quite a lot of disappointment that this is not going to last. And uh, these guys are going to come in the moment things quieten down, they'll come in. Today, China has the most developed renewable re energy, but China in the world, we all know that. But China, the epistemic engine in China also builds major dams and engages in deforestation in Southwest and Southeast Asia. And that's true of the other Asian states as well. Uh, more than 100 hydropower dams, as I said, have been constructed along the Mekong, increasing reservoir capacity from just five uh, uh, cub uh, uh, cubic kilometers to 70 cubic kilometers. China has, uh, I've already talked about these numbers, but the Lao PDR has 16 dams on the tributaries of the Mekong and many more in the Blaming Thing. Chinese multinational hydropower companies such as Huanang, Three Gorges Corporation, SDIC. If you think Western multinational corporations are big, you should see these guys. SDIC is the biggest state-owned Chinese corporation. It has a whole empire under it. Um, and uh, these, these, these uh, companies are often involved with local governments in building dams. Also, there are also other Asian and multinational companies involved in that. The potential profits and debt servicing to international financial companies, uh, dr uh, these are the things that drive to make the financial rate of return on power output uh, the most important priority among all others in the construction of dams. And here we may see the imperatives of the epistemic engine, right? Okay, we have to get at least a 17% return on every uh, unit of output kind of thing. And so that is the, can we go on? The river as seen by the epistemic engine. PRC, Lao, PDR and other states 
view water resource the source of essential and highly profitable hydropower necessary for the development of their nations, right? State planners, engineers, developers, technocratic elites engaged with dam planning and building principally for hydropower appear not to see the multi-dimensional losses that occur to ecosystems and ecosystem services of the river basin or to the multitudes of people who are affected by these losses and receive little benefit from them. They go from being river people to road people, you know, by the roadside, you know, do whatever you can. Moreover, because these rivers cross or form national territorial boundaries and have multi-scale effects, they don't seem to care about how changes on one part of this 800,000 kilometer Mekong River basin affects the river in another country, right? So who cares, right? Uh, hydropower alters, perhaps irreversibly, the hydrology of eco ecosystems by decimating fish stocks, preventing natural flood, uh, fertilization of, of the floodplains, inundating agricultural forest land, and promo promoting salinity. Okay, uh, I just have a few examples. How am I doing on time? Not well, right? I'm doing okay? Okay. Uh, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, have we moved to the next? Okay, I want to talk about the Tonley Sap. How many people here know the Tonley Sap? This is, yeah, you know it, I'm sure. Not many others? Okay, uh, let's show you a picture of the Tonley Sap Lake. Okay, here is this incredible lake. And well, I don't have a full picture of the lake. It is a lake in Cambodia near... Um, near Siem Reap, that is where Angkor Wat is, right? And it was very important, I think, historically for Angkor Wat as well, the whole Tonle Sap area and the river in area. So let's go back. We'll come back to this. It is the largest freshwater lake in South, yeah, go back, Southeast Asia and connected to the Mekong by the Tonle Sap River before the former forms the Delta and enters the sea in Vietnam. So this river is going between these countries, forming the boundaries of these countries, but also going in in two ways often. And it is among the most diverse ecosystems of lakes in the world. The livelihood of the population that live on and around the lake is dependent on the annual flood pulse, right? When the river swells up and floods over, which is a very good thing. Uh, if you are prepared for it. Uh, that in turn is dependent on waters of the Mekong that backwash into the lake in the rainy season. So in a way, you see what is happening is that the, can we just see, go back to the first map, to the last map. Actually, you can't see, it's in the top right-hand side. You can see the long blue line coming down and it comes down to the delta, which you can't really see. It's a very active delta because it's totally been, uh, um, uh, urbanized or agriculturalized. But you can see that this river also goes back towards the Tonle Sap Lake, which is that deeper blue uh, further into Cambodia. So there's a backwash that goes in and fills up. And this is how the Mekong then uh, regulates itself. It is the really the backwater. But this backwater has, yeah, we can go back to the text. So the the livelihood of the population uh, on this, dependent on the flood pulse, uh, is really uh, is really very important for the ecology of the whole region. Tonle Sap Lake rises by as much as twenty six feet during the rainy season, and then subsides when it starts to drain again. An event that Cambodians mark with a three day festival of boat races and fireworks. Uh, they, I mean, you know, it's like the end of a season You, because they've collected their harvest. It's like their bihu or whatever we, we call it, right? Uh, and, uh, that, and in 2019, the mark was 10 feet below normal of what it should be. That's how much all this dam building and sand mining and so on is affecting this. Meanwhile, the fertile Mekong Delta in Vietnam, which supports 17 million people, is itself in 
really imminent danger of subsiding and becoming part of the sea because of the blockage of the flow of sediment and organic materials due to dam building and sand mining on the Mekong River further upstream. So what is this is, you know, it took 7,000 years of sedimentation all the way down Mekong to create this Delta region and make it one of the most fertile regions in the world. It was probably like Bengal before the uh, 19th century and the Ganges Delta and so on. And, uh, and, and then within 70 years, this, this, this start, the subsidence started. And it is said that by, certainly by the beginning of the next century, if not by 2050, much of this will be under seawater. In fact, there's a very interesting Vietnamese film that I haven't seen made as an underwater film where everybody's having tea and so on underwater, you know, just as a kind of parody. Uh, so what they have to see is the the whole ocean, the whole river has to be seen in a whole basin kind of system. Shall we go to the next uh, slide? So I want you to, no, no, I mean the next, the picture, yeah. The two uh, maps out there on the uh, on the top right, uh, what you see is, on the right is all the sort of uh, uh, the agricultural and the sort of occupations on the Delta region. On the left, although you cannot see it very clearly, you know, the deep blue refers to areas that are already under the sea, under the sea level, less than zero meters uh, from sea level, right? And there are two spots you can see on the top end there. And uh, the rest, the light bluish kind is, you know, two to three meters above. This has been subsiding very rapidly. Uh, meanwhile, you see on the Tonlis app how people have adapted to the levels, you know, of uh, and the kind of bounty that they have when the flood pulse arrives. You will just put a thing around uh, a certain part and you can catch all the fish you want, right? So uh, next, next slide, please. Now, I, I'm not going to do, I don't have much time, but this is just to talk about civil society activism on on the Mekong, transnational, trans, you know, all these Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar even, and uh, less Laos. But uh, there have been, there was a Mekong River Commission originally as a Cold War thing set up by the US uh, that wanted to build dams along these things. It didn't work out then because China, of course, controls the headwaters. Then uh, you had the then you had ASEAN develop, which developed very because it's a modern regional thing. It has very advanced uh, uh, rules, at least on the paper, for um, um, uh, all kinds of uh, environmental governance and civil society role and things like that. So by the two thousands, you had. 200 civil society groups and others from the Mekong and other countries who launched a scathing critique of the Mekong River Commission. And then you had in 2008, the Mekong mainstream dams, people's voices across borders that really took a very active role. You know, it's probably around the same time as the Narmada and these people have connections with each other as well, right? Although I don't know specifically about Narmada and Mekong, but there are connections. So these civil society groups have been increasingly pressing the Mekong Commission to adhere to the more inclusive and sustainable priorities and procedures of the World Commission of Dams that was adumbrated around the year 2000. It's for smaller dams, much smaller dams and better governed and inclusive and all those kinds of rules. And that World Commission on Dams was actually put together by a collection of civil society groups from Spain, from India, the Narmada people, and um, a few other Latin American countries. They pushed for it and got these regulations. I don't know if they're being followed. But behind the Mekong River Commission is, of course, always the powerful role of the Chinese corporates and their Asian partners and state power together with local state elites who are, of course, much more interested in hydropower for electricity, profits, and so on. Okay. Next, please. Oof, even I can't read this. <laughs> so local knowledge. Uh, I, I'll just talk this. I won't. Uh, yeah, so I, I have an example here of how local knowledge is so central. So the Mekong on the Thai-Laos border 
has on the Thai side and the Laos side had these villages that had traditionally an agreement of sharing their fishing rights, right? We don't call it rights. They, they do it under the concept of a dhammachat, dhammachat, which literally means it, it has a kind of a religious conception, not overly so. There are, you know, uh, temples and so on, but it's not a religious thing. It's just an organization that allows them to do this water sharing arrangement. And they're called luangs. And what is interesting is that there was a lot of local knowledge behind this water sharing. So there are parts, especially during the Mekong flood pulse, there are parts of the river that uh, are, have rapids and huge amounts of water come through. And then between the rapids, there are deep pools where it's not so high, I guess, the, the riverbed. There are deep pools, and in these deep pools, the fish spawn, especially during the pulse. And that is what they know. And they know where it is and what it is and how to share it and so on, right? Now, what the Chinese do? Well, the Chinese decided that they wanted to send ships down the Mekong. But some of these rapids were too narrow and too shallow for these bigger ships to go down the Mekong. So they had this plan to blast the riverbanks and the riverbed. That would, of course, finish off the <laughs> what, what arrangement these guys had. So there was a very, there were these, some of these village leaders, well, I must say on the Thai side, and one of them in particular, whose name now I don't have, but uh, had been involved in the Mekong River uh, protests. And he organized uh, this whole community and took their case to the Thai parliament and made the case and stopped it, at least for the time being. Everything is for the time being, right? And, uh, and, and stopped it. And then they went back there and they devised a new system because the fish had already lessened to a great extent. So their new system was to uh, have sequential, you know, okay, one from the Laos side, one from the Thai side, sequential time-based fishing and amount that you can catch and things like that. So they did that. But even more than that, one of the interesting things that they did was they stepped up, they pumped up, they intensified the Buddhist ceremonies in the uh, temples, rocks and waters and so on, right? So to sacralize it in a sense, you know, this is not some originary sacral, sacral uh, sacredness, but they have sacralized it as a protection from uh, the engine, right? And, uh, but at the same time, they've created, these local people have created the Mekong School of Local Knowledge. There you go, where they have actually recorded fish species from traditional ecological knowledge with measurements, habitats, spawning seasons, etc. And they have specimens and uh, pictures and so on. And they have this, this whole thing out there. So these are all sort of, they have realized the power of local knowledge and local community to protect their case, at least for the time being, as I said. Can we go on? So discussion, the last, last two, three slides. As in the Prelang and more generally, the Mekong resistant cases, there are two notable points. The first is that biodiversity is closely related to cultural diversity through local knowledge, right? Second, while historically cosmological nations and, uh, did I say nations? I don't know what I, notions and experimental practices had sustained the commons of these marginal communities, they are clearly not sufficient to resist the epistemic engine of capitalist nationalism. These communities had to creatively combine traditional knowledge with modern knowledge, uh, uh, modern knowledge, institutions, and media technologies to be able to hold them off. And scaling is another thing that I haven't talked about very much. Indeed, the best chance for uh, biocultural diversity is the vital role of these people, right? And they collaborate with local and regional NGOs, scientific youth groups, and so on, including global groups, uh, to, to put pressure on their governments and hold uh, organized capital, uh, hold the feet of organized capital to a fire, right? Between the local community and the legal order, 
there are flows of environmental activism. They're often spiritual across different scales, enabled by the new media and as custodians of this emergent sphere. For instance, we begin to see their effect already at the UN. So the UN had very recently, you know, Kunming is the capital of Yunnan, right? So the declaration in the UN, this 2022 on UN Convention on Biological Diversity was a Kunming declaration. Um, brought in because the government is beginning to res respond to the NGOs and so on there. And also the, the UN also has the protection of indigenous rights uh, uh, um, document and statement that is uh, was also uh, developed very recently in the last five, eight years. And uh, the Rainforest Initiative uh, has also. So these are sort of signs of normative goals that are brought about by the global environmental activism. Of course, they depend very much on how nations uh, respond to these. But at a certain level, there are pressures on nations to at least abide by some of them. So next, please. So what I, I want to talk here about something I've talked about before that this is a involves a notion of the sacrality of nature, right? On the one hand, uh, these uh, it, it's sacred for the local communities, whether they because of their uh, um, uh, what is the the word, you know? Anyway, because of their religious ideas and so on, and. Uh, the, but there's a convergence between the sacrality of these communities and environmental activism, modern environmental activism in developing a new idea of sacralizing nature, right? After all, what do we mean by sacred? Sacred is something that is inviolable, right? It protects, and this inviolability of nature is protects the source of life. And it's really a legacy of ecological spirituality. The modern expression of sacrality is that of a protected area as the common heritage of homelands, right? So protection, whether it's UNESCO protection, you know, we have 160,000 acres, 160,000 legally protected areas, 1,000 world heritage sites, and over 12% of the land across the world uh, is protected in some form or another, whether locally, nationally, or internationally, or so on. So. I think this sacrality represents both a belief and a self-conscious hope, right? And as I've said, these uh, they do uh, recognize sacred sites across uh, Asia, New Zealand, Latin America, uh, North America, and so on, right? You have even in India, I think the uh, the G Ganga has been declared, uh, uh, yeah, has its own rights at any rate. But this is a, a complex debate even with what does it mean to have rights and uh, so can we have the last slide please oh god it's still not the last issue <laughs> agency what does agency mean here on the one hand some people would say that imposing this idea these modern ideas of sacrality and uh, rights and so on is a kind of an epistemic violence right i think it's ashish who first used the word didn't you ashish Epistemic violence is busy doing other things. But anyway, is it epistemic violence of one system on another? Uh, historically, but I think that historically communities always adapted to their changed environment with the available cultural and political resources. Of course, there is a core element of it that is being violated. But there are many contradictions between modern conservation, conservation agencies and local communities. Local communities do not have the exclusive concept of environment or nature, the elements of knowledge and practice that are pertinent to modern environmentalism or conservation. These, their ideas come in a package with a variety of beliefs that uh, are sort of uh, not acceptable. They're considered superstitious or so on, right? But nonetheless, there's a core pertinence, right? In how they think of their, and in that can be the hinge that, locks the two together. In this context, the two sides have to adapt to uh, one another so that the pertinence conserves interests of the local community embedded in modern conservation programs. Finally, I go back to the, yeah, last. I go back to this map uh, and uh, this diagram rather, and I want to show that uh, if you look at uh, both the left side, there are, in fact, many of the um, 
civil society groups, which are there on the top there, really come from an enlightenment cosmology, right? They come, they emerge from there and they seek to intervene uh, politically and so on. But, and on the bottom side, which should have environmental movements and indigenous movements and so on, uh, come from a non-enlightenment cosmology and seek to influence both uh, world politics and the world order through their own activism. But in both cases, they also go through the mediation of the epistemic engine. They can also. And so what I want to say is the enlightenment epistem, uh, they go into the enlightenment epistem also in order to go beyond it, to place the centrality of nature in the global agenda. So I'll leave it at that. And sorry for speaking so long. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very complex uh, is a little too complex uh, i think yeah reading of how uh, sacredness local committees and modern conservation are adapting to each other mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're not just separate. i mean there are lots of problems also yeah. but <laughs> so what we'll do is it's about 5 30 uh, we can spend about half an hour taking questions and comments uh, be brief i have a few comments that i'll come towards the end uh, uh, but thank you very much for a wonderful paper. Thank you. So can I invite uh, people who are online can write in their questions uh, in the Q&A or the chat box, whatever is there. And uh, those in the room can begin the conversation. Uh, you need a mic because there are people who are uh, online. And I need some paper. You need paper. some paper? Yeah. I have paper. I have paper. It's one of these works. Thank, thank I you so to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that I don't get a chance to preempt them. Yeah, go thank ahead, you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for returning and taking us onto a new threshold. Uh, I had a series of uh, also provisional questions. First is I'm wondering if this moment that you are entering yeah. is a kind of exceptional window of two decades starting from the 1970s and kind of peaking in 2015 which which goes with the boom of you know the whole boom period social movements uh this whole voice of climate change yeah. ecological movements and then that window is slowly closed in fact i think it's closed now almost yeah. closed now then you have this new threshold yeah particularly in South, Southeast Asia, with yeah. you mentioned, see, uh, we have our own citizen scenario here, yeah. a very anti-social uh, you know, movement. The global shift with uh, the move to electric and the globalization of a very destructive forms of mining with cobalt, nickel, you know, yeah. this, this external externalities of, you know, good science. Yeah. You move to electric, right? And the whole speculative economy. We are, in, we are they're really there now. So where does this form of thought, because it's really a kind of thinking through a kind of problematic mm -hmm. of co-living, what kind of window are we looking at? Or are, is this a kind of historical study mm. rather than a projective study? Because apart from Lula, I, I can't see any opening. Uh, the international system is kind of paralyzed today because of war and, you know, the, so what kind of windows are we talking about? Or is it a very interesting, specific historical moment that opens up certain ways Quite of thinking? Closing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's, uh, so should I hold the questions or should I respond? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really thought provoking and uh, uh, it's an outsider question. Yeah, sure. So I'm not an expert on environment, et cetera, but I really like the way in which you have uh, used this EE model yeah. to explain uh, the power structure there. Yeah. Uh, but I have two critical remarks to make. Yeah. One is that the two points which you made uh, at the end of your presentation mm -hmm. Uh, I do not find they are sufficiently developed in the middle of the presentation. So that's why 
in the middle of the presentation it appears that you are actually uh, saying something as if that there is uh uh ee model mm -hmm. and there is local knowledge so mm -hmm. it appears to me that you are sticking to that conventional binary yeah, of some kind but when you reached to the end i think this is something which re we really uh, need to know more about mm -hmm. uh, from you that uh, in what ways especially the second point uh, the insufficient uh, ways to respond to uh, the global crisis mm. the insufficiency in insufficiency or incapability of local communities to respond to that mm -hmm. and i think that's a sec uh, that's the most important question in mm. my view because this glamorization of the people mm. has gone mm. and yeah, there is a need to actually look at or problematize the idea of people in relation to environment mm. afresh mm -hmm. but i uh, was actually hoping to uh, know more from you from mm. that but uh i think it is important that one second thing is uh you know in fact yeah quickly very quickly mm. uh your point about ecological secret mm. uh, i think uh, the possibility of appropriation needs to be spelled out clearly mm -hmm. because we cannot say that the mm. ee model is mm. not political and the ways in which these issues are also appropriated to reproduce the idea of people and the pure secret mm. in terms of environment cannot be ruled out Hmm. Uh -huh. uh, why we have to see that vulnerability is being imposed on local? Uh, did you find uh, uh, any support uh, to modernity or progress by the locals in Southeast and West Asia? Yeah. Okay. And then the one comment, and then we'll have to respond. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Please go. Ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm Very sorry. Good. What is your name? Dhananjay. Dhananjay. Uh, one would be, what could be the critique of communitarian notion of environmentalism in this specific region? The communitarian? Notion of environmentalism, mm. critique of it. Mm. And do you also uh, see hierarchy in the notion of agency? I mean, feudal yeah, and non-feudal sure. in yeah. this way. And would you like to make difference between modernity and modernization, yeah. the capitalist accumulation yeah. in the context of Southeast Asia? That's <laughs> Five questions, I think. Well, you will start with the next one. Okay, fine. Why don't you just go ahead and give, give her the thing? Yeah. Homogeneity of movements of the local communities, which you talked about, uh, uh, you know, they appear somehow, the community appears homogenized and sort of unchanging. Yeah, non uh, so I would just wondering what are the kind of, and within them, I mean, there must be tensions and conflicts because sure. there would be, you know, some taking a different position yeah. and, uh, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> these are all difficult questions and all questions that would probably take two or three books to answer, right? And I'm in no position to write two or three books, so you guys will have to answer some of them. Um, the first one from Ravi, social movements decline. Yes, I think, I think you're right. What kind of moment, what kind of moment is this? And, you know, how can we really project the future? Uh, this is certainly a moment where I think that uh, there are global forces, uh, quite apart from, you know, the, the national politics, right, that are pushing towards uh, some kind of alternative vision. If you, if you just look, just, uh, just uh, you know, just as a sign for the increasing numbers of uh, uh, statements and declarations and goals of the United Nations, you see that they're increasingly... Uh, projecting this role of island communities, of indigenous communities, and, you know, people like uh, Greta Thunberg and the whole sort of youth movement and all of these people. They are, so it's, social movements are not 
entirely gone, but uh, they do have a different kind of focus, right? And it's a very urgent focus on getting the, as pressure groups, right? This is the other thing that is happening. There's, these are not entirely revolutionary. These are revolutionary in a different sense in that they are proposing a, a different model of life, right? Of living, but uh, it's not about progress necessarily. It's not about some utopian goal. It's about survival in some ways. And uh, so I do think it is a moment where there is, of course, as we know, increasing constriction into national uh, uh, groups. And uh, But I think that the pressures are felt even among uh, even among uh, these uh, nationalist organizations, there is something, there is both resource nationalism, which is what we are seeing here, but there's also uh, nationalist uh, or the nation state, green nationalism, right? They say they want to argue that we're greener than others. And how this happens, this is certainly the case with China. China has a whole model of ecological civilization, right? And this has been going on for 15, 20 years. It's a top-down model. So it's very good at producing renewable energies and so on, but not very good at biodiversity or empowering local communities to do this. In fact, people have called it uh, not uh, authoritarian environmentalism, but uh, environmental authoritarianism. So through environment, it becomes more, through its environmental policy, it becomes more authoritarian. So that's that's one kind of lens to also see this new, this new moment, right? And probably they're doing the similar kinds of things in weak ways in places like India and so on as well, right? And... Uh, 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 this is, uh, I mean, yeah, it's Hindu environmentalism, if, if there is uh, very much going on, right? So it would seem that the, the terms have changed, but uh, politics and environment can coexist uh, within certain frames. And uh, this could also be linked to the last question of Chitra and Dhananjay that, of course, then this, if this is the if this is what is happening, then certain groups of society get favored over others. You know, I don't know how uh, a Dalit environment, Mukul Sharma has this whole debate with what is the name of Radhika Borde. Does anyone know the name? You know, yeah, Borde. No, no, it's Borde. Bodia. She anyway. She also works on Sarna. She works on the Sarna movement and so on in among the Santhals. So, uh, and you know, she very much thinks that it's a women's movement and so on. But Mughal Sharma, of course, shows how you have uh, Santhals and Dalits in opposition to each other about this. So you have you have tensions among the subalterns as well, you know, on these kinds of things. So, of course, there is a role for that, but how. What do you want to focus on at the moment, right? And and your question may link to this kind of environmental authoritarianism uh, can in fact uh, pick on certain groups, right? And and privilege them and or not, right? And there have been and and Mukul Sharma has done a lot of work on Dalit uh, environmentalism and and not only the exclusion but also the things that they have done. I think and it's very important work and. Uh, um, so that's uh, that's one set of issues, if I may answer both together. Uh, the other is the, yeah, local knowledge environment. Uh, how the environment model uh, can be, is it, it, it rep how it can appropriate the notion of the sacred, right? Yes, I think that's always the possibility. So, and especially if you have, you know, this, this, uh, this arrow that first goes directly from uh, civil society to environment versus the epistemic engine, that is precisely in the epistemic engine that the NGO gets co-opted, right? So there's always that possibility and we have to live with that possibility, right? And, and hope that there are, as well as the other way, right? I mean, you can see tribal groups and so on also getting co-opted. But for the bulk of the people, their livelihood is at stake. For these marginal communities, their livelihood is at stake, right? So I think you will have forces that go in and try to push it. I don't know. I think the end result will certainly not be a wholly alternative, non-humanist order. 
but there will be uh, what i wanted to say actually that I didn't that these ngo people they are not they are humanists they're not necessarily more than human uh, or incorporative of all the the human survival is very central to them but what they do is by sacralizing nature they compartmentalize they create a compartment within the epistemic engine and uh I don't know how whether this compartment can be enlarged or some kind of tipping point takes place where you know it flows over. But so in a way, somebody was asking, is it a normative or a descriptive? It is essentially descriptive, but can we ever not be normative? Right? Can we ever not expect and hope that certain directions uh, will go? So I think I'll say that. Uh, is that there was a last uh, Ravi Kiran support for more, uh, it's also about appropriation and hierarchy, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Ananya. Thanks, Professor Dwara. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, that, you know, both. India and China, um, I mean, from, from the state, you hear a rhetoric about, you know, uh, both civilizations being green, etc. Mm. And having, you know, tradition of ecological knowledge and, yeah. uh, you know, harmony between uh, humans and nature, etc. Et but the reality in both countries is quite the opposite. <laughs> Uh, I mean, absolutely devastating uh, developmentalism mm -hmm. um, combined with uh, political repression uh, equally, I would say, despite democracy, uh, at least in one of those two countries. Um, so, although maybe in India we started out with better prospects for civil society, non-governmental and people's movements, social justice movements for environmental uh, protection mm -hmm. um, and resistance and dissent of an environmental kind. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, today, I don't think that these movements have, you know, uh, much better prospects here than they, than they might have in a completely repressive mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, country like China. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, because there are, you know, the, the world's two largest populations in these two countries. And we also are neighbors with so many other very populous countries. Um, the impacts of, you know, our dam building and our pollution, et cetera, are, are absolutely catastrophic for, for this entire part of Asia. Um, so I, I was a little surprised actually, pleasantly so if I may, if I may say so, to, to hear that, you know, there are indigenous movements, both within China and in, in the Southeast Asian countries and in the um, sort of larger neighborhood um, that are sort of trying to take the initiative uh, to stop a certain kind of predatory mm -hmm. capitalist development, mm -hmm, uh, which mm -hmm. has reached its end point. Mm -hmm. It has reached its logical end point, hasn't it? Uh, or and it's not predatory it, capitalism. Well, it, in the sense that it it's no longer at all, you know, sustainable. Sustainable. Or, or, it is not sustainable is not, because the planet is not sustainable. <laughs> yeah, in the in the way that it's going. So so I so I would like to hear from you if there is more to this resistance internally than we hear about in the outside world, um, and if it actually. Uh, you know, can turn the tide, at least for China. Um, I'm, I'm less hopeful about India, although that okay. sounds very strange to say. <laughs> oh, well, say that. I can see that in the last few years. Any other responses? Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. No, you mentioned, and I found that very curious in uh, in Cambodia. There was the I'm forgetting the name now. The key community yeah. who was suppressed, they were excluded from the traditional areas by declaring 
those regional reserve forests. Yeah. But there was this other community which was very successful in resisting yeah. the state and so on. So what were the dynamics of that? How, how did the two play out so differently was the question I had. Yeah. And in passing, you mentioned something about only 3% resources going to local communities that didn't quite... I have a feeling there's something very important there, but you mentioned it. We can talk about no, I, that I, you, you went through that very fast. In passing, 3%. I mentioned... Huh? 3%, yeah. 3%. yeah. No, that was a different situation. Yeah, okay, yeah. let's do that. The, the comment I had, yeah. and that's to do with your epi epistemic engine. You know, you mentioned the nation state and cap capital and so on. Uh, I think this may, I mean, pairing the two might become later on a, a constraint on yeah. developing this idea yeah. because capital has actually gone beyond the nation state already. Oh yeah, sure. And the nation state is a much more limited thing and uh, Eventually, there's a tension there between the nation state and, and, mm. and, and capital. And the real protagonist, if I may say so, is really global, I mean, capital, trying to appropriate and eventually in the process destroying nature. I mean, that's the real story. And the nation state is coming in the middle as, you know, creating more complications and, you know, uh, making things worse. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I think the distinction between the two yeah, yeah. is the. I guess. So, anyway. Yeah. I'll... Okay. Finally. Anything else? No, I had a very brief comment because we are on this resistance part of it. Uh, you know, we recently had a colleague uh, doing some work in Kanga. Uh, and one of the interesting findings was that what we call local knowledge or local politics yeah. in the age of social media has a completely different dimension. Yeah. It's become far more performative is organized very differently. So it's not just something available on the ground. There mm. is a something, just as I said, a new kind of sacrality is being mm. built. Similarly, this whole, what, what we call the local is perhaps changing. You had a small point in, towards the end mm -hmm. when you talked about the media, but perhaps it's more important mm -hmm. than just one other element. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to have your thoughts on that. Okay. Okay, so Ananya, uh, China, um, I think there is hope for China, but you know, when sea level rises on the, they have the capacity, this is a book by Naomi Oreskes and her collaborator, a call, uh, the end of Western civilization. And has anybody seen that book? No, no, she wrote it specially for, and I used it with my undergraduates. They hated it because, you know, it was so alarmist. But what she argues is that uh, this is a, it's kind of a strange, uh, not historical fiction, it's real history because it uses a lot of real materials, you know. Uh, Amitabh, I think, would like that. I mean, you know, from, from history. But it's writing it as if it was written by Chinese historians writing 300 years from now about the end of Western civilization. And uh, the long and short of it is that the Chinese with their system were able to move the populations inland. Whereas uh, in the Western civilization, just, you know, just disintegrated. I mean, it didn't die or anything, but it's lost its power and its influence and everything. And they were just caught in, uh, a mess. So that was her story. And the, the, the undergraduates hated it. A lot of them hated it because they were just alarmist and what are you saying and so on. But I kept trying to tell them that, look, what she is saying is that unless you get your system in order, unless democracy becomes less about plutocracy and all of this stuff, you're, you're going to lose all your democratic institutions. You're going to, you'll have to, because you'll become, you'll have to become a China-like kind of uh, uh, thing. So, so it's a warning that, you know, take this seriously, get the institutions in order and so on. They didn't buy that somehow. <laughs> I don't know, but they still hated it. But then, uh, so what I want to say is that there is the sense that China will ride over, uh, among the Chinese as well, 
there's a sign that this is all Western decline kind of idea and it's the West that will decline and so on. And we have a system that can manage things and we can ride this over. Now, whether or not that is true, of course, is left uh, for anyone to see. But certainly I would talk about your points, Ananya, more in terms of different systems, right? Of how authoritarian system. Of course, here you're having an authoritarian system that is uh, not doing very much on the, on the Chinese side. I think they certainly want to model it on China, but with uh, with the Indian uh, characteristics, or should we say Hindu characteristics, <laughs> rate of growth. <laughs> So uh, that's, uh, that's, I think, one of the things. And, uh, but there are, I mean, in China, there, there was a huge period, not a huge period, a window from, as I said, the mid 90s till 2012 or 13, when it was known as the green public sphere. And all of this, especially in Yunnan, where you have minorities and, and links with a lot of Southeast Asian communities, you did have movements. I mean, Let's 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 be clear. These are also local movements. They're about the local communities. They're not necessarily thinking in terms, but they know who what the problem is, right? Who's causing the problem? That's that's the interesting thing that they know, and at least their leaders. Uh, but you know, NGOs also have their own uh, problems. So and and their own hierarchies as well. In fact, among the key in uh, Cambodia. They uh, said after a while, you know, all these students would come in and they would uh, be very helpful. They would help us with botanical knowledge, you know, scientific botanical knowledge, this, that, and the other. And they were great for a while. And then he found that these student groups were uh, always uh, fighting with each other and so on. And so they told them, you get out, you know, we'll handle our own thing, right? So in a sense, there are all kinds of there are all kinds of problems and tensions. Nobody, nothing is going to go away on that side. I was just looking at the whole question of can how do people respond to these issues of the loss of uh, biocultural diversity is what I'm really looking at. So uh, Shudipto's question on uh, key versus the areng. Um, you know, I think the key was also successful. They have also been successful. I mean, you know, there has been this enclosure, but they've been successful for ever since the movie came out, right? 2010 or 2011, they've been very successful and they've garnered a lot of support. And these have been efforts to sort of close off and logging has hap been happening in the, uh, in the reserve itself. The Areng, it was a special event, I think around 2015 or something, when the Chinese prospectors or surveyors had come around before and they knew what they were up to. They want, going, wanted to flood a whole valley. And um, so they kept them off, right, around 2017, until 2017. Uh, so it was a different kind of threat. It wasn't people going to log and this, that, and the other, although that is also happening. The threat here was the possibility of a huge hydropower uh, coming in and doing it. So they prevented that. And they were not sure, this was just before the Hun Sen last elections. And they were not sure that after the elections, if he gets stronger, he would let them come in or something. But I haven't followed that up. So it's a different types of events with different types of successes and failures. Okay, uh, then you had a comment about the MSTM, yeah, I've always, you know, I've written about the, the, the difference, the tensions between the nation and capital, and precisely that capital tries to deterritorialize while nations territorialize. But at the same time, capital needs states. They need states and they, they it looks for states with certain regulations and so on, right? So now we've reduced our what, income tax levels and so on for uh, for capital to come in and it is coming in kind of, otherwise they just ignored India anyway. So, I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which capital does move in, but at the same time, you have the state seeking to bring capital in and contain it with, within its, its formulation, right? So I think there's a mutual dependence and it continues even when at, at this, at a more abstract level, now when we're beginning to see this kind of closing off to global capital 
and con confining, right? China itself uh, says, okay, we're not going to be dependent any longer. We'll create our own regional markets and things like that. Uh, we're not going to be dependent on the US. The US is also trying to industrialize within and so on. But nonetheless, we also know that there's a whole global supply chain uh, issue that they continue to have to be dependent on, even if they're changing their partners, right? So I would say that to some extent, the nation state also has power, right? To do this. Um, that's my point, that they are not, it's not just global capital that can just run roughshod. Although it's always has the point, advantage point, the nation state also comes back in some ways. Uh, and it has to because of its, uh, we see, I, I'm speaking now from an American perspective that we see very much that this whole, um, you know, Trump movement and so on has very much to do with, uh, uh, with uh, people losing jobs and with people seeing all these foreigners coming in and this, that, and the other. So the state has to then contain the effects of globalization made by global capital. Dinu, your point about Kangra and local knowledge is very well taken. Actually, that is what I was trying to say, that for instance, they play up their religiosity, right? In the, I found that very interesting. So they're responding to what the media and what the, but I guess I didn't emphasize media enough, but that was the idea, both in the Prelang case, when they're doing it through avatars and so on, they're appealing to a whole set of different people. I mean, have they even heard of the movies before? I don't know. But when this happened and through their connections, that's another form of global connectivity. You know, it starts in Bolivia, the Dongria cones take it, the, Cambodian key people take it, become very interesting, I think. So yeah, I think the whole media effect has to be as something that is generative and is emergent, right? It gives the possibilities of emergence. So local knowledge is not necessarily, uh, but I think the core of it, that's the pertinence issue that I was talking about. The core of it is still very much uh, something that is related to their livelihood needs. And we cannot forget that, right? Why are they even doing this, right? So, so on that note, uh, should we call today? Yes. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Lovely to have you back. It and was lovely to be back yeah, yeah. and to speak to old friends and to old and articulate friends who, uh, it was a great uh, also trial for this, first trial for this talk. Thanks. Yeah.